Welcome. You're listening to Literacy Now, the official podcast for the nonprofit organization Parents for Reading Justice, and I am your host, Brett Tingley. We are very excited to be here today with Nora Chabazi. She is a former neonatal nurse, which I think is very interesting. Um, she's the parent of a dyslexic child, and she started Ebly to teach teachers and kids how to read um, using the science of reading. And she's a consultant on the Truth About Reading documentary. Is there anything else you want to share with us about your background that we should know? No, I think you, you've covered it. Okay. Um, the reason I think being a neonatal nurse uh, especially in the vi- environment today, is actually an advantage, is that you're not indoctrinated through a college of education. Can you talk about how um, coming from medicine, the science of reading just fell into place for you? Yeah, well, of course, having that scientific background and with neonatal ICU, um, with kids that have a lot of um, difficulties in, in a whole bunch of areas, looking at how the brain is so malleable and flexible and plastic and how we can grow those neural pathways. So that scientific piece of looking at what is possible and how you know, we can move far and fast with anything from a neonate to you know, a child or adult who, who is learning to read or learning to read better um, really helped me very much and also my ignorance was pretty much bliss in that I didn't have limitations. I, a lot of teachers that I talked to tell me that, oh my goodness, well, they can't, because especially if we have a label with it, it's kind of the bar is lowered in their mind and I didn't know any different. I just had that bar and kept putting it higher and higher, especially at the beginning when I was first had my reading center and started training teachers and all. It was just like, yeah, this is possible. And then we'd see in classrooms even more is possible. So I, I always looked at how, I didn't have those limitations that a lot of times teachers have been told or taught that, well, if they have this, they can't do that. Or So I think that that's really a big difference. And also being mindful and aware of the brain and how we can fertilize it and grow it. Yeah, I think that's so amazing because unless you're familiar with it, kind of the neuroplasticity and the ability to, like you didn't have limits. And I think that that puts you in a really unique position. Um, I think that's amazing. So how did you start doing this work? So you were a neonatal nurse, then how did you transfer over? Well, I worked as a neonatal intensive care nurse for about 10 years, and then my then husband was in the military and we moved to Guam. And I had three little girls and didn't, there wasn't a hospital with, that I could work in there, it's a very small island. And so I stayed home with my girls for three years. We moved back to Michigan and my youngest was still in preschool. So I had decided that I was gonna stay home until she got into school. And in that, the time, my daughter Colleen um, was put in gifted and talented because her math scores were so high, 98th percentile on the Iowa test. But on that same test, she was a, le- a year below grade level in reading. Mm. And she was looked at as the best reader in first grade and even into second grade because she was a great memorizer. She could memorize the story. She couldn't, she couldn't read a sentence if you pulled it out of that same story, but she could memorize the whole thing. And, and one of her favorite tricks was to look at the ceiling and read, you know, read the story. So that, but what really pushed me into my mission and journey on this was in her second grade parent night up on the wall was some of her writing. And she got 100% on every spelling test she'd ever taken because she had a good memory. She couldn't spell those words usually by the time she got home that day, but she could do it for the test. And this story had 40 words in it and a beautiful illustration of dogs. And I can still see it, it was three in from the classroom door and I was looking at it with tears running down my face because it was I couldn't read it at all. Horrifically misspelled, 19 of the, tw- of the 40 words. Um, no p- capitalization or punctuation either, but the spelling, and the teacher came out and um, I had been working in their, volunteering in their room. She said, what's the matter? And I'm like, did Colleen get a brain injury? I mean, are you sure this is her work? How, how is this possible? So that, paper, you know, I still, it's on beautiful, on construction paper, I keep it right next to me in my drawer in my my office still, 25 years later, because this was in 1997. And so that started me on this journey. I started researching. The first book I ever got was Why Johnny Can't Read. We're at a Michigan football game, as a matter of fact, and we've gone into this bookstore, and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna get that. So I, I read that book, I got all kinds of research for six months, really, in my Christmas letter, it's all I talked about. Does anybody know, like, because Colleen had been taught, um, 
when we were back in Michigan, a, a more whole language approach. Mm. When we were in Guam, though, she'd been taught a beka, which is a very traditional phonics, you know, sound uh, approach. And she was fine when there was one letter, one sound, but when it got to a little more complex, she's like, I don't get these rules or these exceptions. It just didn't make sense to her. So she, um, she, with her struggles, my research for about six months, I researched and went, I mean, I went to schools and observed their reading. They let me in. It was really wild, but that was 25 years ago. And I went to conferences. I mean, I was all in like 5,000%. I did a lot of things. People would think it's probably kind of crazy <laughs> at this point. Not um, there. And probably even then. And so about six months in, my mom called me. She said, my neighbor has 12-year-old dyslexic twins. And they went to this place, they've been special ed, they went to this place in East Lansing called the Reading Center. And after 12 hours of instruction, they were no longer in special ed. And I'm like, mm-hmm, and I'm Marilyn Monroe. I don't think so. <laughs> um, but okay, mom, so she had the number and I called the Reading Center and the owner answered. And that Weinshank is her name. And um, she had been a professor at a large university and had for 30 years. And she, I said, what are you teaching? Is it, son, is it phonics? Is it whole language? What is it? And she said, no and no. The research shows exactly what you need to do to teach anyone to read to their highest potential. And both of those things actually have positive aspects to them, but there's many things that are actually going to be detrimental to kids. But the research shows what you need to do. And I'm like, okay, where's this, you know, where's this answer? And she um, directed me to a book called Why Our Children Can't Read and What You Can Do About It by Diane McGinnis, who recently passed, which makes me very sad because she's my hero. Um, and that book changed my life completely. Um, it wasn't out in bookstores yet. Um, so I ordered it from the publisher and it came in the mail. I read the whole thing in, before I went to bed that night. And um, I taught her in just a few hours and she actually was reading chapter books. This child had never read anything she hadn't memorized in her life before then. So I'm like, I'm looking at her. I'm like, is she really reading this? She got done and she, she read the whole thing in one sitting, this whole Bailey School Kids book and told me all about it. And I'm like, that's, her spelling took a couple years to get better, you know, to get completely where she's spelling correctly. but. Um, so then I started telling, you know, uh, when you talk about this, almost every person has a child or someone in their world yeah. who struggles. So I started bringing them into my house and voluntarily teaching them because I'm like, is this a fluke or what? And then I got trained in phonographics, which was what the, the program was that they talked about. And I became a trainer. I accidentally opened a reading center. My then husband wanted to open a wellness center and he'd rented a building. And about a month before it opened, it fell through for him. But he had said, why don't you come and teach the people here. So I had this whole reading center. And um, and then I trained in photographics for about four years, but there were limitations that as I kept learning um, that I was not within my contract of that. And so I quit being a trainer there and I thought, well, maybe I'll go back to nursing. And um, probably, probably a week later, uh, a whole county, this um, nonprofit in a county called, and, and we've been doing work with them for years, and said, we would like to offer to pay for any teacher in our whole con county to be trained by you. And I'm like, oh, I don't have anything to train them in. So uh, <laughs> that's how Ebony was born, to be honest, out of necessity, really. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's a system, so it continually evolves. So that, um, and, you know, at our reading center, we have people literally from all over the world now that we do virtual to and in person. But mostly what we do is focus on teaching teachers, classroom and remediation teachers, so that they can get the kids what they need so that they can move far and fast. So that's my story. Parents for Reading Justice is a nonprofit grassroots movement dedicated to ensuring every child learns to read by engaging parents and educators in adopting the science of teaching reading. Please watch our award-winning film, Our Dyslexic Children, take our master class, and to ensure all our services remain free of charge, please consider making a donation today all at parentsforreadingjustice.org. So my, my background is engineering and business. And so I'm not familiar with the education theory either, but the idea that there is continuous improvement as research um, continues, that there will be more effective, more efficient, quicker ways to teach kids how to read. And so w your work is very exciting. Um, I think it could be the next evolution. Yeah, and I wanna speak to that if I could, because yeah. um, Ebley is a say, spell, read program, speech to print, linguistic phonics, it's called different things, but 
what the kids say as far as the words they say and the sounds and then spelling it and then reading it. So it's a different um, progression than traditional phonics is. And so, you know, that's foreign to most everybody actually, mm -hmm. but it's, it's what makes it really powerful because these kids bring to the learning what they're already good at, which is speaking. Mm -hmm. And then that's where we go from, instead of from tra traditional phonics goes from the letters on the page, which is man-made and is not natural, right? And we go from there and try to fit it into the speaking in the words, which makes it much more complex and, and takes a lot longer to do. Mm -hmm. So there's so much great research and brain imaging research, and we just have some research in for the, uh, some federal research to, to study Ebley too, because we have to always look at, just like in medicine, the evolution, you know, there's so, I have a whole list, I have a whole wish, wish list of things I would like researchers to study about, you know, what I'm positive over these last two plus decades helps really accelerate the learning of, of anybody, you know, dyslexic or not. And, um, you know, in getting that, but research takes time. Like this, this federal grant is over five years. So it takes time to, to, to see that. But, you know, we, we have to look at um, all of these things and understand that wherever we are now, you, me, anybody teaching anything, that we can move to, you know, just like the Wright brothers. They made that plane and it just keeps evolving to more and better and getting you there faster. And, and yeah. that's what we... Well, we got to keep okay. looking because yeah. we can keep helping yeah. more children more quickly. Well, in my opinion, until we get to 95 to 100 percent proficiency in literacy instead of 35 ish nationally, we have no room to rest. Yeah. Amen. So we are here at the premiere of your film at the Beverly Hills Hilton. <laughs> it's so exciting. Uh, you played a critical role in getting that put together. Um, what did it take to get to this, to get this film out there? Oh my goodness. I look back two years ago and think we had no idea what we're getting ourselves into. I think Nick, our director, th th thinks the same thing actually. Um, you know, this started with John Corcoran inviting me to a, a retreat at Jack Canfield, the author of the Chicken Soup books, um, at his home. And the retreat was supposed to start the day after the country cut, shut down for COVID. So of course it was canceled. And we did it virtually that year in 2020 in September. And they have you bring some things that you would like their team to help you with. And you get on the hot seat and they tell them what you'd like. And one of the things we wanted was a film on John's, um, on John's story. We wanted research on Ebley and a couple other less, you know, more minor things, I guess. And what they said is, you know, we think you should do a documentary first. And we have the, the uh, director the perfect director, here's his number. And we literally called him the next day, Nick Nanton, and, um, or emailed him, and he emailed back and he's like, yeah, well, that's interesting, John's story, but it needs to be bigger. I'm like, oh, you want a bigger story? <laughs> we got a bigger story for you. So after that, he wanted to meet. We met within two weeks, and this was at the end of September of 2020, and we, the first press release for this went out in November, the beginning of November. So, I mean, you know, and we had to, raise the money ourselves. And John and I are like, we don't know how to raise money, but we can do it. And, and the money also had to not be connected to anyone promoting anything, you know, that we're selling anything. So it was all individuals mostly um, and, and all. So, so that was interesting. And then once we got enough money, we started filming in the middle of a pandemic. And I had the privilege of being able to go around to the film crew around the country and sit in and, and consult with Nick and you know, send he and Katie, the story producer, all kinds of information and educate them. And they're brilliant as how, Nick said, how am I such an educated person? He's a lawyer and he sees that I haven't been living under a rock and I didn't even know that this was a thing. And so it's been, um, so from May of 2021, and then we finished filming, I think this summer of 2022. And um, it has been a journey. I've learned so much and it's been exciting and exhausting and, you know, <clears throat> nerve-wracking mm -hmm. <laughs> and all kinds of things. So to think that today's the day, it's just kind of surreal. And my hope and my goal always is for high-level literacy for all, and I just really feel that this film is, is gonna put rocket fuel to making that happen. Um, by looking at literacy and reading from a holistic view from all kinds of different angles, because he, you know, interviewed researchers and teachers and administrators and parents and learners and adult learners and pretty much everybody you could think of. And from not just one angle, from lots of different angles to look at it from 
you know, kind of that holistic manner. Well, and that's what I was going to ask you. What are your hopes for this film? Well, moving us closer to high level literacy for all is the overall one. And for me, I really don't have expectations in that ever since I started this journey, it's been divinely guided, to be perfectly honest. It's really not been me. It's come through me, but it's not been me. And it's when I look at it, I'm like, it's none of nothing I ever wanted to do. It's nothing I ever thought to do. Um, it's it's meant to be. And for some reason, I am was the person to be on this path. So I look at this movie and everything that fell into place perfectly and the timing is perfect that it can't be anything but exceptional. And so I just have, and I have such faith in Nick, um, and I know his integrity, and I know his brilliance, and I know, you know, his heart. And so I don't really, as far as specifics, know or um, have a thought of what that's going to be, but I do know overall it's going to be monumental. Well, and I think your point about just raising awareness. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I talk to people and you say only a third of people are kids in the country are proficient readers and nobody can believe it. So if it does nothing else but just raise the public awareness, that is so important. Yeah. Well, we have to we have to know there's a problem before we can fix the problem. Now, for me, I'm really tired of talking about it. You know, it's been a lot of years of talking about it. I'm really impatient for action. And I, there's so much that's happening in that realm. I look at Emily Hanford and her APM yes. reports, and I know you know Emily. I look at Maria Murray and her starting the Reading League. I look at Donna Heitmanic and her with the Science of Reading page. Those three, to me, have <clears throat> really started in the last five years this movement toward action and change. And change is hard. Change is hard for everybody. but. Um, you know, in big established systems like the education system, it's even more overwhelming, <clears throat> but it's possible. And for me, that's the action piece, you know, be aware and then take action. And, and let's all work together. You know, let's work together in, in a united way instead of in this divided way and in little pods and pockets and that are kind of warring. It's just other. I, I think that's fascinating too, because what you're mentioning, again, if you're in science, the way we both were, or are, um, if there is something that's new and better, you just go to that. There's no shame, there's no, what was I doing, no guilt or whatever, but there's this whole weird thing in education where somehow you're to blame, you were doing the wrong thing. Well, most colleges of education are really not following the science, and so it's, it's not the educator's fault. No. It's really not the teacher's fault. You know, it's kind of like blaming a child for not being able to read. The same thing, blaming a teacher for not teaching reading when they've never been taught how to do that. You know, like we were just talking last night to Anne, who's just like, I got blamed for not being able to read and I don't know how to do it. So you have to help me. Be the same with teachers. We have to give grace to teachers and, ha and understand. And the College of Education, you know better now, let's do better, right? And with the teachers, when you, it's human nature to resist change. And it's human nature to have, I think, that that resistance of like, oh my gosh, look what I've been doing. Um, and I could have been doing it better. But I have this analogy that I like to use with teachers when they say, look at all those kids from the last 20 years that I have failed. You haven't failed them. You've done the best you could with what you had. And it, when I was 16, I got glasses. And I'm like, there's leaves on the trees. This is crazy. You know, I could see the delineation. I, I mean, I didn't say these darn glasses when I got contacts 10 years later. I'm like, this is cool. You know, it, they're a lot more convenient and they work a lot better. And then 10 years later, I got LASIK surgery. So we're always going towards more and towards better. I, I was talking to my friend who's here with a donor for the film who is a neonatal ICU nurse and, and a major administrator um, at, at a big uh, hospital. And she said, you know, now our 25 weekers, we give them surfactant, they're not even on an, uh, you know, intubated. We used to have them on a ventilator until 30, 32 weeks. Now I'm not looking back when I was a nurse, you know, 30 years ago and saying, oh my gosh, I was a horrible nurse because I didn't have that surf surfactant. So what you're saying is it's an evolution. And our goal is to unite, work together, all of us, parents, teachers, administrators, community, society as a whole. Let's work together and let's move this needle. Let's move it far and fast. We can do it. We know how to do it. We know how to do it. This is not like something that's like, oh my gosh, we can't solve this. We can solve this. It's right there. But not if we keep, you know, 
locking heads and blank, playing a blame game. The blame game just does not work. It doesn't work and it doesn't motivate people to change. No, it, it inhibits change. Mm -hmm. um, I have a friend who, her dad used to work for the IMF and she has a dyslexic son. And she told me that she talked to him about the, this whole issue. And he said, I have never heard of a problem that has a solution that affects so many people that we are not acting on. I know, it's, it's overwhelmingly horrific. You know, it really is, it's horrific. And, and why? Why are we not acting on it? Why, you know, there's, I do say that in my journey with this and looking at it as an outsider working on the inside is most decisions in education and in literacy for sure revolve around power and politics and ego and money they don't revolve around kids and teachers and learning and how we move the needle you know so there's a whole systemic change that needs to happen and can happen but you know, I look at Virginia and how they had. A, how do you get a hundred percent of Democrats and Republicans to all vote yes on the same thing? Really? <laughs> and they voted to to for this bill to have the the instruction based on research at the college level, at professional development for teachers, in their curriculum, in their materials for kids, all the way down seventy million dollars, and they all voted yes. We now have a blueprint to do this at the state level. That is, you know, it's just recent in the last few months. So let's do it. Well, and that's why, um, not to toot our own horn, but what we're doing, we're specifically designed to, to help parents become a part of this conversation. Um, I don't think that parent, people realize that parents are kind of the missing link. We've got legislation, we've got IDA, we've got a lot of state legislation, mm -hmm. um, but parents yeah. can vote in or out those legislators, the school boards, uh, and we can help through the district school board put in place an administration that will follow the yeah. science. And we see day to day with our children going into school what actually is going on. Yeah. And if, if what they're saying at this top level is not coming into the classroom with our children every day, we also have legal rights that we can leverage to help bring the district to the science. So that's what we're hoping to bring with this. this well, podcast. and I think when you, I think that when you go from the top down and the bottom up, yeah. both because what I see at our reading center and, and the parents and the trauma that walks through every single day, the parents are traumatized, the kids are traumatized. There's so much trauma, but these parents are you know, going to, and they're educating themselves so much more. And they're going to the school and saying, how about this, look at this, and doing it in a way that's not confrontational, because you guys are good at that too, but here's the facts and here's the deal. <laughs> it might be a little yeah. confidential, but we sometimes, it can't be comfortable. It's, it's just the case, but these parents are, they go into the school and they get intimidated. Mm -hmm. but, you know, when you put a box of Kleenex in front of a parent when you're gonna meet with them, that's like, who has a cold here? Now that's not what this is for. We don't need to humiliate the parents. We don't need to humiliate the educators or any of that. What we need to do is we need to work together. And these parents, I think the parents, you're right, the parents are the key. Because mm -hmm. who's going to fight? I changed my whole entire life because of my daughter's mm -hmm. uh, you know, literacy, sub-literacy problems. You know? And every student and teacher that I see, I'm like, you're going to help prevent millions of more of Colleen's happening. This is what's going to happen if you'll do this. This is what's going to happen. So this will be my life until the day I die. I People say retire. I'm like, retire? <laughs> I can't retire from this mission. That's just not okay. You know, until it's, until we're there, you know, no. And I hope in my lifetime that I see this change. But the parents, and also with COVID, when they got, you know, with the Zoom lessons and stuff, parents are a lot more educated on what, how instruction really looks and what happens. You know, at our reading center, we've never had, we've never actually advertised it, um, and but people find it from everywhere. But since COVID, we've never had a waiting list in, since 1999, never had a waiting list. And since COVID, we've had between 40 and 80 people on our waiting list consistently. We'll get 20 off and another 30 come um, because parents will do anything. And you know that, this is what we're doing. You know, I, I, the, that drive comes from, and it makes me a little choked up. I can remember 1997. I can remember my beautiful child who would hide behind, who had no self-esteem, who who's, was crushed 
because she knew that she couldn't do what the other kids could do, you know? And it was, it, it was totally preventable. This could have been taken care of as, as a kindergartner, as a first grader. And for me, let's put the, the fence at the top of the cliff and prevent all these kids falling off and needing the ambulance at the bottom. And let's do, let's do it. We can do it. And, and parents are huge. And, and they're, getting, they're getting braver and more courageous too, to, to not be cowed when, when they feel intimidated by you know, things. So I think that's amazing. Yeah. From all angles. Absolutely. <laughs> I was going to ask you, what is your advice for parents? But you basically said just fight for your kid, educate. You have to educate yourself mm -hmm. as a parent, you know, and I think educate yourself in specifics of what, what I do a lot with Ebley is we do, we give a lot of free things. I get in trouble from anybody who thinks <laughs> business. They're like, you're a horrible business person. I'm like, I know. Oh, well, but I'm really good at literacy. So there we go. Me too, yeah. um, but but educating yourself, we have a lot of free webinars on our, our Ebley website for people to come and learn about what can I what tweaks can I make to change? Because my kid is, you know, they're guessing all the time. Well, they're guessing because they've been taught to guess. They've been taught to look. So here, go to the guessing monster web at free webinar and do the things that we tell you and show you in there. So educate yourself about what needs to happen. Parents know in their gut, just like teachers do a lot of times, like, oh, there's something rotten in Denmark here. But there's so many free resources. Go to the Science of Reading, what I should have learned in college, Facebook page. For teachers, for parents, go to the Speech to Print Exploration Facebook page. There's People give you tons of resources, and many of them are free, but parents need to be advocates. They need to be educated. You know, it doesn't mean they have to go and, you know, get a degree in, you know, whatever, but they do need to read and look and learn themselves. You know, if I, my principal, my daughter's principal said to me, her dad's a doctor, she'll be fine. Now, if I had to believe that, she would not be, she'd be in her thirties and a non-reader, you know? So don't believe that. Mm -hmm. That's Trust thing your gut. Say. Yeah. Yeah. And come to our website because we've got all kinds of tools to help parents not just fight this one on one, but as a group. And we found that there's great strength and leverage yeah. in coming together as a group to try to flip that yeah. whole district for all the kids, even the, the kids who don't have parents with the resources that you and I did. Mm -hmm. And that's true, parents, you know, we all like a community and that's what you guys did so well and so uh, beautifully is make a community that we're working together because so many people, kids and parents think, well, I'm the only one. Mm -hmm. Guess what? You are not the only one. Yeah. <laughs> there is a huge community, an interesting story. One day we had a student in our reading center and the mom said, well, the teacher said they don't, they don't have any other kids that are like this and she's just, they don't know what's going on. This is a struggle. As they were leaving, another mom and child were coming in. They were classmates. And they're like, oh, you're here too. <laughs> they told that mom the same thing. You know, it's not true. There's a lot, and, te and teachers are self-preservation also, you know, with like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. I'm doing all that I know to do, because they are, they, they don't know any different, but they're learning and that's happening. And with parents saying, what I do actually is give Emily Hanford's, um, you know, uh, radio documentaries and say, listen to these, you know, and I tell parents or I tell teachers too, I want my administrator, listen to these to give them a foundational awareness and then let's have a conversation and then move from there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of different angles that you can come from, but nobody wakes up in the day, you know, in the morning to say, how can I do a bad job or harm children, right? From any perspective, but working together, we can make this and get this high level literacy for all happening a whole lot faster. And that's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We're doing it. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Literacy Now is a podcast designed specifically for parents in our effort to ensure every child learns to read. Parents deserve a seat at the table and we bring their voices to the fore. We invite you to join the Parents for Reading Justice community on all of our socials and make sure to visit our website to watch our documentary and to take our masterclass. All of our content is free of charge because every child deserves to learn to read. This episode was brought to you by ParentsForReadingJustice.org, produced by Brett Tingley and Keita Mascaro.